All right, guys, how you doing? Good, how are you? Good. So, uh, and I told this morning's group this too, um, the university has sort of indicated that like when we have classes that are run exclusively Zoom, and I'd appreciate this anyways, that they want students to have um, their video on. It just, it's so nice to be able to see people too, rather than um, just talking to your names. Uh, Andrew at least has a picture up, but if I can see your faces, that's always so much nicer for me. So thank you. Um, so what we're going to do today is it's it's going to we'll, we'll probably work for about an hour and then we'll take maybe like a 15 minute break and then we'll come back and kind of do a part two. So, you know, normally what I've done in this lab is it is a little bit of wet lab stuff, but it's more me demoing some wet lab stuff, but I'm going to just kind of try to walk walk through it because I didn't want to have another lab that we um, had to had to split up. So I think it worked well this morning with what we did to kind of try to go through and um, kind of brainstorm how an FPLC works. We're going to have sort of a demo protein mix that um, we're going to purify, or at least I'm going to tell you how it gets purified, and then we'll kind of have you guys analyze the results from that. And then we're going to work in the last part on a simulation. So for, for better or for worse, a lot of what today is going to be is um, uh, a bit of just me telling you about stuff, you know, note taking and and all kinds of stuff like that. But I think this morning's group, when they left, felt like I think I understood, you know, how proteins get purified because that's what we're doing over the next two weeks, and that's kind of why I decided that we really needed to have this lab, even though it was a virtual lab, because it'll make a lot more sense for you guys next week um, if you actually have sort of gone through this lab first. So, part of what we're going to do here is go through and answer um, the uh, uh, pre-lab questions here. So some of, some of these pre-lab questions are going to lead us into understanding how, how some things work. So the first thing I wanna do is just take pre-lab question one, and I'm gonna go through these five proteins here. So with some of them, I'm just gonna kind of tell you a little story about them. These are all proteins that we're gonna, um, with the exception of papain, uh, these are all proteins that we're going to study or learn about in some way, shape, or form. So just some little stories that go along with them. So the first one is glucose oxidase. Why this is actually really interesting is this an, is an important enzyme used in glucose monitors. So when you think about how um, a glucose monitor works, and I don't know if you, anyone has ever sort of tried to test their own blood sugar, you gotta prick your finger a little bit and then you kind of um, take a little bit of blood out on a little piece of paper and then you put it into an instrument. Has anyone ever told you what happens in that instrument? So it's actually the enzyme glucose oxidase. And what this enzyme does is it does oxidation chemistry. And what do you guys know happens with oxidation chemistry? Oxidation is the what of electrons? Loss. Loss of electrons. So what happens is you actually lose electrons. Do you guys know what electricity in your walls is? That's also electrons. It's electrons in your wall. So what happens is we get glucose to lose electrons. We create a little circuit and the flow of electrons through that circuit is directly proportional to how much glucose is there. So neat little chemistry that basically relates the number of glucons that glu the number of electrons that flow through a wire with the amount of glucose that's there. So we'll learn more when we, uh, again, diabetes is gonna be a thread that we carry sort of throughout here. So we'll talk more about glucose monitors um, a little bit later, but uh, someone wanna share, what was the information that you found out about glucose oxidase? I need to know a molecular weight and then a PI. My molecular weight was weird. <laughs> what was it? Um, it was 160 KDA. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, so that's not wrong. No. So <laughs> it, it just that stands for kilodaltons. So a, a, a Dalton is essentially the same thing or related to grams per mole. So you normally think of molecular weight for regular things like grams per mole, but we think about it in terms of a unit called Daltons for proteins. So 
proteins tend to be on the order of at least five kilodaltons. You know, uh, the ones we're going to see here, this is the largest one or one of the largest ones we'll see at 160 kilodaltons. How about Corinne for a PI? What did you get as a PI for that? <clears throat> Excuse me, sorry. I have 4.2. Yep. So one of the things that we're going to note here is I've also intentionally chosen these five proteins because their molecular weights are, um, some of them are similar, but some of them are different. And the same thing with their PIs. So sort of a big thing that we'll talk about here when we do protein purification is how do I separate what I want, my protein, from all the contaminating protein. So I'm going to need to find something that's different or unique about my protein in order to do that. So I don't have really an interesting story to tell about papain. Um, it is a, a protein digestive enzyme. Oh, it's not one we're really going to study, but it kind of fit into um, this group of five proteins that we were going to study here. Um, how about a molecular weight for that? How about you, Andrew? What did you have as a molecular weight for papain and a PI? Can't hear you yet. All right, let me go to Emma. You are the next in my list of people. What did you have for um, uh, a size and a PI for papain? Um, for a molecular weight, I had 23,406 Daltons. Yep, which is 23.4 kilodaltons. And how about a PI? Um, I had like two different values. One was 8.75 and then the other one was 9.55. Okay, so let's say it was pretty much between 8.7 and 9.5. Okay. Um, esterase. So esterase, a lot of these enzymes we're going to find have digestive sort of components to them. So the little story that goes along with this is this form or uh, is going to break ester linkages in triglycerides. And let's see, Lexi, did you have, what did you find out for esterase? Um, 31,463 Daldens and then the PI was 6.54. And I think this morning's group had a little bit different. So what did you have for, is uh, the molecular weight? Um, 31,463 Daltons. Okay, so let's just say 31.4 kilodaltons. Now, one of the things we found out this morning as we were going through these answers is it, it can be species specific because someone found an esterase that was like 100 and almost 170 kilodaltons. So we can have a lot of variability here. Um, but for this little exercise, it's not gonna not gonna matter too much. Carbonic anhydrase. Is that one we've heard of before? Yeah. <laughs> uh, let's see, Connor. Um, what did you get for carbonic anhydrase? I got thirty kda. Mm -hmm. uh, not sure if that was right, but then I yep. couldn't find a pi for it. The closest one, I, I don't know if it was right, it was 5.9. Okay. How about anybody else? Did anyone else find a KD or a, a PI for that? I had six. I did 6.6. 6.6? All right. I'm going to put 6.4 to 6.6, .6, which is in line kind of with what people, but again, this is going to be specific as to what organism you might find it from. Um, and just reminding everybody, right, we know carbonic anhydrase is important for kind of managing the disguise of carbon dioxide is bicarbonate. And then we've got cytochrome C. Has anyone heard of cytochrome C before? Know where we might find it? This is a really critical component of the electron transport chain. So we're going to learn about it later. Um, but one of the things that when I do this lab in person, I have little vials that show each of these five individual proteins. And I ask students to notice, did you see anything unique about them? Um, one of the things that they'll notice is that, um, uh, and I'm gonna do this here, glucose oxidase is yellow. So we're gonna see some color that we have to these proteins. 
And then cytochrome C is a red, like a brick red color. And what's interesting with cytochrome C is it has that red color because it also has a heme that's bound to iron. Oh, you guys are not even seeing. I'm you you need to tell me. I'm writing all this stuff. Say, Dr. Prenny, we can't see what you're writing. Oh, hang on a second. I'm not even connected with my iPad here. I'm just connected on there. So hang on a second, then I'm gonna give you a minute to write. Darn it all. You guys gotta speak up sooner when you're like, you do you think you wanna be sharing your screen with us? Sorry about that. I had to run to put out the fire in the kitchen. Now he really didn't start a fire, but he wasn't supposed to start macaroni and cheese on his own. I went down when we had a break with the first lab at noon. I went down. I said, anybody hungry? I said, I've got 15 minutes that I can make you make you lunch. Nope, not hungry yet. I said, okay, you're going to be hungry later. And then he comes upstairs like right before lab starts. And he's like, I started making macaroni and cheese. I'm like, no, you're not supposed to do that. Not on your own. All right. So you probably have a lot of this information. So I don't think I need to like repeat it, but you can just kind of see all of this information here that we've been talking about. So glad I realized this before we got too far along here. Um, so cytochrome C has this red color because of a heme that's bound to iron there, but this is actually doing a different kind of process than we saw with the heme and hemoglobin. That was for the reversible binding of oxygen. In this case, the heme and the hemoglobin that are here actually do undergo an oxidation chemistry. So we'll learn about this later, but that's kind of an interesting thing that this, this iron does go to an iron three plus, and that's how it transports electrons in the electron transport chain, because it actually does undergo that oxidation chemistry. But importantly, um, we need some data on this. So who have I not heard from yet? I think Kate, I haven't heard from you yet. What did you find out for cytochrome C? Um, I had molecular weight of 11.7 kilodaltons, and mm -hmm. then I had a PI of 9.6. Good. So what we can see here, and the intent of this initial exercise was I've got a range of molecular weights. We kind of have about two, you know, two, three sort of categories here. Um, again, if esterase happened to have fallen in a very large category, we'd have... Um, you know, these very small proteins like cytochrome C and maybe papain and carbonic anhydrase are a little on the smaller side, maybe medium sized protein. And then we've got kind of a large one with glucose oxidase. And then we also have a range of PI values. So kind of ranging from something quite low with um, glucose oxidase to something um, on the high end here with cytochrome C. Okay, so we're going to come back and revisit this slide because it will be important for us to think about um, how we can use this information to rationalize a separation of these proteins. So again, remember in lab, imagine I had shown you little vials with all five of these proteins. We kind of talked about them. You saw some color differences and so forth. And then what I physically do is I mix them all together. And then we use our FPLC instrument to purify them. Okay. And while the instrument's running, I usually go through and we uh, write a little scheme for how, um, how this uh, machine works to separate um, proteins. And let's see, I started at my last slide here, so I'm going to move this. All right, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to draw a scheme, and this is actually answering one of your post-lab questions that you have already. So we're going to get through, you know, at least 75% of what you need to do for your post-lab uh, for this week, just kind of working through things here. So I'm going to draw a little schematic, and I want to show you guys um, a couple pictures here. Um, because one of the things you have to draw is a scheme. You can draw the scheme like I'm going to have it right here or you can choose to draw it another way. And I'm trying to find, where are these pictures here? Did they fall off? Oh, did I put them away? Sorry guys. Everything is sitting out here from last class. And now I can't find them. This is weird. 
I must have, I had to have put them away. I'm, I'm losing my marbles a little bit here. Oh, well, I'm going to try to find them on my computer here and I can share them that way. Oh, let's see. This will be easier probably for you guys to see anyways if I open them on my computer anyways. All right, so I'm going to stop sharing there for a moment and then open these guys to share here. All right, and let me just rotate this. This is um, a student's work from a couple years ago. Rotate. Rotate. Oh, that is. All right, so we're going to draw ours like this, which is basically going to show all the components of the instrument kind of in a line here so we can understand how they're all connected. But here's how another student in the past has drawn them. Um, he, he said, I want to draw it exactly like I see it on the instrument. <laughs> Kate's eyes just bugged out there. So, but this was how like his understanding was. And so this is what the um, instrument actually looks like. So let me zoom in on this picture here. So he wasn't far off in terms of what the instrument looks like. Um, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through the scheme first and then we'll kind of come back and we'll map it onto this picture that we have here so you can kind of see how that works. But so I'm going to share my screen again here so that we can draw through what this scheme looks like. Has anyone ever had to draw a scheme for another class? I know if you've taken like instrumental analysis, you have to draw a scheme for that. Has anyone done, that, done this in another class before, drawn a scheme? Okay, so essentially we're just drawing, imagining this as being a start to an end of our, uh, of our instrument. We're going to start, the starting point is really taking two buffers that we have here. So I'm going to have buffer A and buffer B. So every time I'm drawing a box here, this really just represents a component of the instrument. And any time I'm connecting two boxes, that really represents tubing that's connecting these two parts of the instrument. So what I have here is I have a buffer that comes from one flask and a buffer that comes from another flask, and they're each going to lead into a mixer. So that's sort of our next component. And not surprisingly, uh, uh, what the mixer does is it's going to mix a and B together. Okay, so what we'll see with this um, schematic and how this instrument works is we're basically doing column chromatography. So hopefully all of you guys have done or remember column chromatography from organic chemistry. So a lot of the principles are going to apply here, but what we're doing is we're automating the process and almost having it like it's an assembly line. So a lot of it's going to be sort of uh, done for us. Um, and so we'll talk about how that happens. So we'll have the ability of having two different buffers that we can use. And in essence, 
any sort of concentration combination of them because our instrument will be able to pull different ratios of them together. So we'll have anything from 100% A to 100% B to everything in between, depending on what our instrument tells it to do. So after we leave the mixer, then we're gonna go to a pump. So this is a peristaltic pump. And if you know anything about peristalsis of your intestines, it's a rhythmic contraction that moves things forward. It's the same way that you can actually get toothpaste out of your, you know, out of your toothpaste container is you actually provide uh, um, a pressure to it. So this pump is actually going to push things past it, which allows you to pull things toward it. So this is how we're going to keep our mobile phase moving through this system. So the purpose of this pump is to move the mobile phase. So remember, when we do chromatography, there's always two phases. There's the stationary phase, which stays still, and we haven't gotten to that yet in our kind of schematic here. And then there's the mobile phase, which moves through. So our mobile phase is really what we have here with our buffers A and B. And so the pump is going to be moving that mobile phase through. Okay. The next part we get to is called the sample injector. And I'm going to leave this guy blank for a minute. We're going to come back to him because what I want to do is I want to show you sort of the main line of the instrument. And I'm going to use sort of a bus analogy here. And I'm going to say, imagine we're not stopping at the bus stop. We're just going from start to finish. We're not stopping anywhere. So I'm going to kind of show you the, um, the route through without any stopping. I'm just going to make this look a little bit bigger here. So this is my sample injector. Okay, so the next stop along this pathway is going to be our column. And this is our stationary phase. So this is where we're going to have a lot of options in terms of what we can use as our column material. Sometimes this is also called a resin or beads. This is whatever you're putting inside your column. So if you did a column in organic chemistry, it may have been a silica column or something like that. So it's whatever material you're putting inside of your column. The next stop along this pathway is a UV detector. This is a little spectrophotometer that measures two wavelengths. It measures 260 and 280. One of these measures protein and one of them measures nucleic acid concentration. Does anybody remember which one is which? Which one of these is protein? Is protein the first one? Protein is 280. But thanks for guessing you had a 50-50 shot, right? So protein is, is 280, DNA and RNA, is going to be 260. So we've got this little spectrophotometer that we have here. The next stop along our pathway is going to what we call a conductivity meter. And this basically measures ion concentration. This tells us how salty our solution is. So there's lots of things that could be contributing to the saltiness of a solution. It actually might be salts themselves. We might have proteins that are charged. We might have nucleic acids that are charged. All kinds of things could contribute to the charge we might experience in our solution as it passes through this conductivity meter. The next stop that we're gonna have here is called a diverter. Okay, now what a diverter does is it can divert between two different places. We can divert to waste if we're not interested in saving whatever's coming through, 
or we can go to our fraction collector. Now, when you guys did column chromatography in organic chemistry, you were probably the fraction collector. You sat there with a test tube underneath as stuff dripped out of your column, and then you had to change to another test tube, okay? This instrument actually has a little robotic fraction collector so that it will know when to change to the next fraction. What's really neat is this can communicate with the UV detector and the conductivity meter. So you can use information about what's coming through the pipeline to say, you know what? If the UV detector isn't registering anything, meaning that there's no proteins, go ahead and divert to waste. I don't need to have anything. Or hey, some proteins are starting to come through. All right, let's divert from waste and make sure we go to our fraction collector. We wanna be collecting right now. So there's some neat communication that can happen be between these pieces. You know, it's, it's like thinking about when you did column chromatography and you had to do a TLC plate in order to see what was coming off. This is sort of doing it all for you. So what I've kind of drawn along here, and I'm gonna give these number ones, this is kind of the number one pathway, okay? And we could either be going either one here. When we're in the number one pathway, we're gonna call this the main line. We've got nonstop, and so there's no passenger pickup. Okay. So when you loaded a column in organic chemistry, you literally physically took your sample and you put it on top of the column. What's kind of neat here is we're gonna have a bus stop that allows us to load and pick up our column. So that's what this sample injector is for. So I'm gonna come up here and I'm gonna put in another piece here that's called our sample loop. And this is where our protein is going to be. So when we want to load our column, we're going to do it through this sample loop. So what's going to happen is we're going to take an offshoot there. We're going to actually turn a knob in that sample injector and just like a bus would turn off the main line to go into the parking lot to pick up passengers, that's essentially what we're doing here. Now what happens is after we stop at the bus stop and we pick up our passengers, we're gonna come back down to the main line and we're going to go to the column. And then we continue along the same pathway as we had before. So we'll see how this works in a minute on a picture, but this allows us to load our column. So let's write down here our number two pathway is going to be our bus stop. We're going to stop at our sample loop and pick up our passengers, which is going to be our protein. That's how we're going to load our column. So I'll give you guys a minute to finish sort of writing, uh, see if you have any questions on that. And then what I want to do is I'm going to flip back to that other picture that I was just showing you, which is a picture of the instrument, and we'll kind of point out where all these pieces are. All right. So let me come back here and I'm going to share my computer screen. I'm going to come back to this little picture. Okay, everybody see the picture of the instrument here? Okay, so <clears throat> I've got a flask here that's labeled water. That's essentially the same thing as 
a flask that would be buffer A or buffer B. And I'm going to zoom in a lot here just so that we can see things. Do you see how there's two tubes that are in here right now? Normally, one of those tubes would be, it be in my A buffer and one of them is going to be in my B buffer. So this is the start of our line, okay? So this is where we're picking up our mobile phase to kind of go through this whole system, okay? So if we looked at your scheme right now, we can see that the next thing that we're supposed to go to is our mixer. So let's trace and follow these lines here, okay? We can see here, yep, they go to our little mixer. Our mixer even has a little line that says this one's supposed to be in the A flask, this one's in the B flask, okay? Everybody see this okay enough? Okay, this is literally like a little blender. It's got a little spin bar in there, it spins around. It's going to mix whatever proportion of buffers A and B we say need to be there. And then it's going to put it through now as a combined solution. So if we look at your little um, scheme that you drew, the next thing that we're gonna get to is our pump. So our pump is actually down here. If we kind of trace this line down here, it kind of goes out of sight for a minute. Here it is right here. But what we're gonna have is it comes down to our pump here. So this is a little peristaltic pump that's in here. And so we're gonna have solution kind of come through this peristaltic pump. And then I think, we're going to have a little, let me, this is too big for me to see right now. Come on. Okay, our next stop is our sample injector. Oh, here we can see it is coming up here. So right coming up here, this goes to our sample injector. Okay. This is equivalent of like our little bus stop. So I'm gonna zoom in here so we can sort of see this. So right now, this is set up that we are stopping at the bus stop, okay? So let's kind of see if we can see what's happening here. This is our line that's coming in. And this is a little knob that the openings inside this knob are where the black line are. So right now I can just follow, this comes in here and I've made a detour to go through what I'm calling my sample loop. See this little thing that says sample loop right here? So I'm gonna be traveling and picking up passengers that are in this sample loop. And then I'm gonna to continue to go to my column. Does everybody sort of see that there? So this little knob turns. So imagine for a second, I turned this clockwise, I'm sorry, counterclockwise, so that this opening right now is at 12 o'clock, this guy now is at 10 o'clock, okay? What that would mean, all of these little pieces turn, you know, um, a little bit counterclockwise. So now what this means is this was my line coming in, it would immediately come right back out. This would be my main line. I wouldn't be engaging any of the rest of this. That's like my bus going right by on the main line, not pulling into the parking lot, okay? If it's in that spot, what happens is when I would load my sample here, it would just kind of come out or I, it would uh, just come right out. This is, this is to waste here. That's why there's a clip there, okay? So this is really my bus stop, if you will. This is where I can change whether I've told my bus to come pick up my passengers or stay on the main line. Okay, everybody with me? Let me know if there's anything you need me to sort of repeat. So remember here, the next thing question. Go ahead, yes. Sorry. Um, so what's the point of having like the sample loop, like of adding more in? And you know what I mean? If you're already having stuff come, come in from like your main line. So the main line only has buffer. It doesn't have our sample. So imagine if this was your column in organic chemistry, you had to physically add your stuff to the top of your column. Wouldn't it be really nice if there was like this little side bubble in your column where you literally could just put your sample in there and it would just get auto fed in. That's kind of what this is. It's an auto feed into the continuous line that we're running here. 
So Corinne, did you have a question too? Someone had, no? Was there someone else who had a question? I just thought of one. Yeah. Why are there so many different tubes? Like why can't it just add it into one tube? Well, we initially start with two tubes because we wanna be able to have the option of having literally an infinite number of concentrations. When we learn on our next slide what buffer A and buffer B are, we'll learn that depending on the ratio that we mix them together, we can have any one of a number of different concentrations. So if you think back to organic chemistry, you didn't just have one buffer. Maybe you started with one solution and then you had to switch to a different solution, maybe a different polarity of your solvent. This allows us to do that automatically and through a gradient. Okay, good question. Other questions? All right, what I wanna do now is sort of talk about, oh, I didn't finish, I didn't finish here. Let's, let's keep going. So we've, we, we've come through now, we stopped at the bus stop and we picked up our passengers and now we're going to our column. So let's follow our line along here. It's probably gonna get lost a little bit as we kind of get jumbled here. So let me zoom out. Okay, so we've got this is coming along and is, oh, actually, this is a bad picture because it's not connected. Normally this line would come out and it would connect up to the top of my column here, okay? And it would then load everything into my column, okay? And then as stuff came out of my column, if you look at your chart, the next thing that we're gonna go to is the UV detector, that's right here, okay? It's gonna go in and then come out of my UV detector. Then the next thing it's gonna go to, here it's coming out of the UV detector, it's gonna go into, this is, I know it doesn't look like much, this is a little conductivity meter, it's just something that measures the saltiness of the solution. And then it's gonna come out here and it's going to come over, and you can't actually see this because it's sitting next to here. On this picture that I took, I didn't take the whole thing. My fraction collector is sitting over to the left here. And so there's that, that little dive, whether we want fraction to be good or not, it'll turn on or off, and we can either collect fractions or not. But that's the whole route, sort of start to finish. Okay, questions? All right, so what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna flip back to my iPad here because I wanna talk about the program we're gonna run on this instrument. So a really nice thing too that this program or that this uh, instrument does is you literally can set it up to run a program. So you guys were the program when you did it in organic chemistry because you had to know when you were gonna change buffers, you had to change your tubes, all of that stuff. This is sort of done for you, okay? So I wanna just kind of highlight what, what this um, program is that we, that we do. So I'm gonna tell you what the steps are. It's not a super user-friendly like program. So I'm gonna tell you what the instrument would say, but then we're gonna more importantly talk about what it means. The first thing it's gonna say is collect all. So these are literally lines of like program that you see. It's gonna say collect all it's gonna say three minutes, and it's gonna say one milliliter per minute. So that's what the instrument will say in red. We're gonna put under here in blue what is really happening. This program that we're gonna set up is going to collect all fractions. That's what collect all means. And just to step back for a second, so again, if we were in lab, I would have had those tubes that had those five proteins, the esterase, the glucose oxidase, all of that. I would mix them all together, and then I'd say, we're gonna use the FPLC to separate them back out, okay? So here's the program that we're gonna have the FPLC run so that we can isolate them. So collect all fractions, that three minute time period means stay at each tube for three minutes. And then this one milliliter per minute is our flow rate. This is really the speed that our mobile phase is going through the system. 
And taking these two pieces together, if we are spending three minutes at each fraction and we're going at one milliliter per minute, this tells us that each fraction is going to be three milliliters in size. So this is just kind of the preliminary information that we need to start our program with. Do you want to collect all or just some fractions? How long do you want to stay at each fraction? And importantly, what's your flow rate for your mobile phase? What is a fraction? So a fraction is the test tube. So when we're collecting test tubes. So the next um, steps all represent time periods that we're going to have. So from zero to three minutes, we're going to just use buffer A. Okay, so what this means is for the first three minutes of our experiment, we're going to only draw from buffer A. And I want to make sure to tell you what buffer A is. So buffer A is 25 millimolar tris, pH 8.1. Now we're going to have, at three minutes, we're going to have an alarm go off on the instrument. Okay? Because What's happening right now, I'm going to flip back to this page for a second. When I am starting this program, my mixture of five proteins are sitting in this sample loop. So I'm having, and remember, I'm starting out with 100% buffer A. So here's the pathway that my instrument is taking. I'm pulling from buffer A. I'm coming through the mixer, the pump. And then I'm going through and picking up passengers, and then I'm continuing on through here. So that's the path that I'm taking. Now the problem is, from a bus standpoint, we don't want to continue to stop at the bus stop after we've picked up all the passengers, right? That's wasteful. We're driving on more road than we need to. So at three minutes, I have picked up all the passengers that I need. So that alarm is just to remind me to change this so that I stop stopping at the bus stop. Does that make sense or do you need me to, anybody want me to go over that again? So now after my three minute alarm, I'm no longer going to be stopping at the bus stop. I'm just going to take a main line through and I'm collecting all my fractions. Now, why is this important? Well, as we'll see in a little bit, we're going to coordinate the time that the instrument thinks something happens with what we're going to be collecting from our fractions. And if we have extra road that we're traveling through, our time sequence is going to be off just a little bit. Just like if the bus driver was continuing to stop at stops he didn't need to stop at, the bus is going to be late. So for that reason, if we don't need to be going to the bus stop anymore, just stay on the main line. Okay, so that's why we have this alarm. So just kind of highlighting what happens here is we are going to disengage our sample loop. We're telling the system to stop stopping at the bus stop. There's no more passengers. We've picked up all our sample and you are going to be late. Which means from an experimental standpoint, we're gonna think something's happening at a certain time, but we're gonna be off because everything got backed up. All right, there's only three more steps in the program. From three minutes to 13 minutes, we are gonna go from zero to 50% B with what we pull up from our uh, samples. So for the next 10 minutes, we're going to be increasing the concentration of B in our mobile phase, in our solution. So it is important that I highlight what buffer A and buffer B are. So again, here's what buffer A is. And so I'm gonna highlight down here what buffer B is. So buffer B, looks a lot like buffer A, 
is going to be 25 millimolar tris, pH 8.1, but then it also has 500 millimolar sodium chloride. So really we can say that buffer A is no salt and buffer B is high salt. And this will become important a little bit later when we kind of um, learn about why salts might be important here. Questions? Every time that you use this machine, do you always use the same two buffers? So good question. Um, no, you can change the buffers that you want. It depends on what you want to be changing over time. So in this case, I want to be changing the salt concentration over time, but maybe you want to be changing pH. So you might have a buffer A that's high pH and then a buffer B that's low pH. And then you can create a pH gradient as you go along. So it totally depends on the kind of um, bells and whistles you need to have. And we'll get to those um, a little bit later after our break. All right, then we're going to have 13 minutes to 19 minutes here. Now we're going to change and we're going to go pure buffer B. So again, what this means for the next six minutes, we're going to only draw from buffer B. And this little program is only 25 minutes long from minutes 19 to 25. We're going to go back to 100% buffer A. So only draw from buffer A. Okay. So the last thing I want to go through here, and then we're going to take probably a 15 minute break, give you guys a bio break with whatever you might need, whether it's a little food, a little, a little bathroom, whatever you might need. I want to highlight what we're going to see in terms of output from this instrument. So this is how this instrument in this process is very different, maybe from an organic chemistry uh, uh, column chromatography. You guys had to constantly do like TLC plates and all kinds of stuff like that to monitor what was going on. This actually is connected to a computer and gathers data and we get something that's called an FPLC trace. And this is a double Y plot. Okay. And as we started this this morning, I went, oh, yeah, we haven't learned about double Y plots because we didn't do our dry lab on um, how to use Excel um, because we we're going to sort of push that back. So if you don't know what a double Y plot is, a double Y plot basically has the same X variable and two different Y variables. So if we draw a double Y plot here, our X variable is going to be time. So time in seconds that's passed. On one axis, we're going to show the absorbance at 280. And so a blue line is going to be our absorbance at 280. And then we're going to show conductivity. And that's going to be a red line. So I'm going to map some important points on here, times where we do something different in our experiment. We changed what we did at three minutes, at 13 minutes, at 19 minutes, and then we were done at 25 minutes. So if we go back and sort of look at this, which you guys have written down already, at zero minutes, three minutes, 13 minutes, 19 minutes, we did something different right? So I'm going to start with my red color here, and I want to think about saltiness of the solution. So when I start out, I'm pure A, so there's no salt in A. So does it make sense to everybody? I'm going to have a nice flat line there.
And then what happened at three minutes? Well, I started adding in my buffer B, which was a salty solution. Now I did it gradually over the next 10 minutes. I increased my saltiness gradually. Does that make sense to everybody? And then I changed again and I said, no more gradual. You go up to 100% B right away. So I'm gonna jump up to super salty and I'm gonna stay there for the next six minutes. And then I said, you know what? Let's go and go back to no salty and do it quickly and then stay like that to the end. So does that make sense to everybody? I was measuring the salt in the solution that was driven by these directions. That's what this should look like. Everybody with me? All right. So the last thing is to realize that when we are doing this experiment, and let's say we're doing this experiment with our five proteins, okay? Each of those proteins is going to have a different affinity for my column, okay? So what I might end up seeing here with my absorbance at 280 is something that looks like this. I might see five peaks here. And if I label these A, B, C, D, and E, I wanna ask some questions about these. And then we're gonna take a little break for a little bit, give you guys a bio break here. And then we're actually going to return back to part of your um, post lab is to actually take the data from the real purification we did, which is going to look very similar to what we have here, and protein. Let me ask you guys a quick question first here. And I want you to answer in the chat, which protein A, B, E has the greatest affinity for my column. So think about it for a minute and let me know in the chat what you think your answer is. Which protein A, B, C, D, or E has the greatest affinity for our column? No one wants to be the first to provide an answer. What's the column made out of? Um, in this case, your it won't matter. It won't matter. We are going to get to that. That question will matter. But to just answer the question, which protein has the greatest affinity for the column, you don't need to know that for right now. But it was a good question, but you don't need to know that to answer. Is that everybody? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I think I need one more. There we go. Let's see. Connor, you are right. Can you, was it a guess or um, what's, your, what's your thought process? It was kind of like my best educated guess. Um, so like peak D was like the ion concentration with the salts and 
A was buffer. You know what? When so you might start start again because you were you got cut off a little bit. Turn off your video just for a second because it, we might not have the bandwidth to do both video and audio. So I want to be able to hear you. Go ahead. Okay. So pretty much, I my guess was that peak D was with the high concentration of salts and A wasn't. So based on the peak, peaks, E was kind of in the middle. And that was really my thought process for it. Not sure if that's the right way or not. So I think for some people, I saw a lot of A's. So some people are like, it's, it's got to be either the first or the last, but I don't necessarily know, know uh, which one. So some people said D with a question mark. Corinne and Kate, you were both like D with a question mark. So, and, and part of that maybe is my inability to like freehand draw very well. So maybe you're like E is past the point of the high salt. So maybe not, but in general, the thing that has the greatest affinity for the column is gonna be the thing that comes out last. Doesn't matter what the column is, we'll get to those details later, but whatever comes out last, remember how this works. We've got stuff that's kind of coming through our pipeline, right? If I come back here for a second, We've got stuff that's coming through our pipeline, okay? And let's imagine that we've gone and picked up everything. Once we come to the column, depending on how much time you spend hanging out in the column is gonna determine when you come out, okay? And when the UV detector detects you. So if you spend a lot of time partying and hanging out in the column, you're gonna be the last to leave and get recognized by the UV detector. So Andrew, that was a really good question to ask what the column's made out of, but truthfully, it doesn't matter to answer this question. Whoever interacts with the column most is going to come out last. Does that make sense? I had it pictured kind of like a TLC plate, like the more it binded to like the actual plate itself, like, I don't know. I think yeah, I no, that's absolutely right because TLC plate is the same thing. Your TLC plate is your stationary phase and right. A TLC plate is really the same material that you have in your column. It's silica, right? You're just looking at it in a little micro mini version on a plate. Okay. But the same is true that the, the, the things that the speed that things will move through has to do with their affinity for that column. And so things that migrate with your solvent front don't have very much of an affinity. Everybody with me? Okay, I'm going to show you something real quick. And then we'll take a break for a minute. So let me share my screen again. Where is it? Hang on, I might have to open this document again. The sun is right in my eyes. I shouldn't complain because at least the sun is out. There we go. All right. So when we come back, we're going to look at this guy. Okay. This is now, had we done this little demonstration in lab where I showed you the five tubes, we mixed them together and then we used our instrument, which now, you know, the whole pathway to go through to re-separate those proteins, we would get something that looks like this. So what we have down here is time. Actually it's minutes here and not seconds. So we've got time that's down here on the X axis. This red here, don't worry about the units, that measures the saltiness of our solution. Notice here how we see something that looks a lot like that line that we just drew. And then we've got a blue line that we have here that represents the concentration of protein. And we can see one, two, three, four, five bumps that we have there. Does everybody see that? So when we come back here, I'm going to start by kind of um, uh, introducing some of what we might have for column materials. And then we're going to return to this guy. And based on the information that we know about what these proteins are, and now, Andrew, I will tell you what the column is, you'll have to assign these peaks to those five proteins that were part of your pre-lab. Okay? 
So let's take, um, we'll take about a 15 minute break here. Why don't we come back at about 3.20? Okay, well you guys can grab something to eat, go to the restroom, whatever you might need to do. Um, and then we'll come back. Um, or how much time do you guys want? Do you want 10 minutes, 15 minutes? I'm good with 3.20. 3.20? All right, so we'll do 3.20, we'll come back and uh, we'll, we'll start by talking about the different materials we have that make up these columns. Okay, so why don't you leave, don't, don't leave the meeting, uh, but you can just mute your mic and your video and then uh, we'll rejoin. I'll see you guys at 3.20. Oh, this one's much faster. So we actually got a new iPad because my husband was borrowing mine so much. I said, you need to have your own and I'm glad we did that because then I could use his today. All right, so what I'm gonna do now is, oh gosh, this is so bad with this light. Um, I'm going to um, transition to talk about and kind of get at, um, at Andrew's question, what, which was what, what is the column material, okay? So I'm gonna come to another page here and what I'm gonna talk about are four different type, types of column materials that we can see. Um, and so I'm just gonna make a little plot here and the top of the plot I'm gonna kind of highlight here and talk about is we need to be thinking at, about um, how do I, <clears throat> sorry, how do I separate what I want from what I don't want? That's our big sort of, you know, main, main idea. How do I separate what I want from what I don't want? So with our proteins, what this usually is going to mean is identifying, um, some you know molecular feature of our protein that's going to allow it to um, be separated from everything else. So the first type of uh, column material we're going to talk about is ion exchange. So what we'll talk about is what physiologic or I shouldn't say physiological, what biochemical property this is going to take advantage of, and so. Ion exchange will take advantage of PI. We're gonna talk about what we attach to our beads. So we're gonna have little beads here. Sometimes we call it a resin. So when you think about your silica resin that you had, we've got essentially beads or a resin that's going to have something attached to it. So we're gonna identify what that X is. And so X in ion exchange column could be something positively charged. If that's the case, we're going to call this an anion exchange column. Okay. What we're going to see here and what we actually used in our little experiment there is we used something called a DEAE -E column. So a DEAE -E column stands for diethyl amino ethyl. So that sounds kind of crazy, but let's, you know, think about what that is. X is going to be essentially attached to a bead. There's going to be a nitrogen group, diethyl, amino, ethyl. So it actually has three ethyl groups there. So it's got one, two, three ethyl groups that we have there. I don't know why they don't call it a triethyl amino group, but it's a diethyl amino ethyl group. So being a quaternary amine, it's going to be positively charged, okay? So being a positively charged resin means it's going to exchange the binding of negatively charged things, okay? So when this column starts out, it can bind positively charged proteins, and then what will, I'm sorry, negatively charged proteins, and then what's going to happen is as we increase the salt concentration, so the, oops, the fourth column we're gonna have here is going to be how we do elution. How we elute stuff off is we're going to increase the salt concentration. So with any of these, we're gonna have our protein have a favorable interaction with the resin. So if we wanna get it to let go, we essentially need to break that interaction. So just kind of uh, very simply here, we want to think about our resin has this X group on it. That's going to have some interaction 
with our protein. And if we want to elute our protein, we are going to have to break that interaction. Okay, so our protein will interact with that X group on our resin. And we're going to talk about a variety of different ways that it does that. But so if we want to get our protein to let go, we need to find a way to break that interaction. And so if that interaction is an ionic interaction, we need to add more ions to break that interaction because then let's say a chloride ion could come in and interact with that ion, uh, that positively charged resin and our protein can come off. Question, Corinne, or no? No, you look like you had a question. You, no, you're good? No, I was just moving around in my seat. I'm sorry. That's okay. That's all right. Okay, so we also have, um, and I just want to highlight, this guy, this DEAE, this is the resin that we used for our uh, five protein purification. So this is the protein, or this is the resin we used for our five protein demo purification. Okay, so that's gonna become important. So Andrew, to your question before, when we try to map on who's who in our experimental thing, yeah, we do need to know what the resin was that we used, okay? So another X group can be something that's negatively charged. We're gonna call this cation exchange. And with this example, what we're gonna see is something called a CM column. A CM column is a carboxy methyl. So if I draw what that looks like, it's a CH2, C double bond O, O minus. So it's a carboxylate group. So our resin is negatively charged, so it's going to bind positively charged things to it. So it's going to exchange cations that's on it. We're gonna loot things off the same way we're gonna use a high salt as a way to disrupt that interaction. Questions on that? All right, next piece is called size exclusion. Size exclusion takes advantage of molecular weight or size, okay? So what happens here is our beads actually have small holes in them. So our beads are porous. So this actually is gonna create a situation which is the opposite of what we see in electrophoresis. Remember with electrophoresis, the smaller something is, the faster it's going to migrate. In this case, because we have all these tiny little pores in our beads, the small stuff actually gets hung up in the pores. And so that stuff is going to spend more time. And so that's going to be the bigger stuff that comes out first. So there's not really an elution strategy here other than time, meaning that you're just going to be waiting for stuff to come out. So highlighting here, large comes through first. Another one that we have here is called hydrophobic interaction. This is going to take advantage of the polarity differences that there might be with your proteins. So we're gonna call this hydrophobicity. So our little bead here is going to have a variety of different nonpolar groups. Maybe it's got a phenyl group. Maybe it's got an octane group. Basically, it's just going to have something that is likely to be greasy. 
right? Something that's going to interact with nonpolar uh, substances. So how do you elute stuff off? Well, in this case, we're going to change the polarity, likely meaning decrease salt concentration, make that solution less ionic, more nonpolar is gonna be how we can get our nonpolar stuff that's kind of stuck on there to come off. And the last piece is one that we're gonna see next week and this is called affinity and there's lots of types affinity uh, chromatography is just a catch-all for anything that takes advantage of a special property of your molecule so maybe the special property of your molecule is that you've got a his six tag right this is what we have on our MGH protein, right? Our MGH protein, that H stands for a histidine six tag. Well, that histidine six tag has a special affinity for a bead that has something uh, that has a nickel ion bound to it. Okay, it's called a nickel NTA resin, but basically there's a nickel that's on there. And that's what creates this very favorable interaction between consecutive histidine residues. So how do we get this to come off? Well, we're gonna use imidazole. And imidazole was something that you had to answer some questions about in your um, first homework assignment figure out where to come forward here back. So I'm out of the sun here. Um, imidazole basically looks like free histidine. So just like in our, our um, anti-exchange um, uh, situations, we had to swap out those cations or anions. In this case, if it's histidine that's causing that affinity for our column, we have to put in what looks like free histidine. So we're gonna put in imidazole to get our stuff to let go. One other one that I want to mention here is maybe you have an antigen. And your antigen is really going to then uh, be important to bind to an antibody that's on your bead. So again, if this terminology is, is new for you to think about antigens and antibodies, an antibody is just a protein that's going to recognize a very specific portion of a protein, okay? So if you have an antibody for your protein, that means it's just very specific for your protein, okay? Usually what you do to disrupt this interaction is you might increase the salt concentration. Maybe you'll change the pH, but those are usually ways that we um, affect and uh, uh, modulate things with affinity chromatography. Okay, so that's an introduction. Oh man, maybe by the time I'm gonna I'm gonna put you guys in a breakout room for a second. Maybe by that time, <laughs> this this it's a little spot in our window that I can't I can't cover. Um, I'm gonna send you guys to a breakout room. First thing I'm gonna do here is I am going to put into the chat that same image that we looked at. A minute ago that FPLC trace. So let me know, give me a thumbs up if you see that in the chat that you can open. Okay, Andrew, I think said it's there. So I'm going to put you guys into a breakout room. You should see like five little bumps that you have there. I want you to try to assign those to the five proteins that we talked about in the beginning glucose oxidase, cytochrome C, esterase, carbonic anhydrase, and papain, okay? So here's some more information that you need to know. Um, this purification was done using this DEAE column. So that was the column that was done. I actually used the same buffers that we talked about here right? So this was the conditions for that purification. So you have all of that information available. 
You just need to sort out for the five bumps that you see who belongs to who, okay? So I'm going to disperse you guys to the same breakout room. That way you can talk freely with, without me kind of here. Um, and then uh, I'll, I'll check in with you in about five minutes here. Um, send me a question if you want me to come into your room. And, uh, but I'll, I'm gonna leave you guys for about five minutes, see if you can sort out this puzzle. All right, that better? I just love it. You guys are trying to say something to me and I'm like, oh, somebody doesn't have their mic on. No, you are just trying to tell me that you couldn't, you couldn't see my stuff. All right, so when we know that something is stable, we know that it's folded and functional. And what that means in terms of the parameters that are provided is we cannot go above the temperature that's provided. And we need to stay within the pH range that they indicate, okay? And the whole purpose of this is that we want to avoid denaturing or degrading our protein. So that's all that we mean, or that it means when it says it's stable under these parameters. Third question asks us to think about one dimensional and two dimensional um, gel electrophoresis. So I want to highlight that one dimensional is going to separate based on one property. And so that's either going to be molecular weight or PI. So we've obviously done some electrophoresis where we've separated by molecular weight. We haven't done protein yet, but we've separated DNA and RNA by um, molecular weight. So that one's pretty straightforward. I wanna spend a minute and talk about this concept of separating by PI, and it uses something called isoelectric focusing, okay? Which basically has a pH gradient in our gel. So I'm going to ask uh, another set of questions here. Let me make sure I can see everybody. So I'm going to ask you guys to tell me it's going to be a positive, uh, negative, or neutral. Okay. If you want something to, if you want something to migrate uh, via electrophoresis, if you want to do electrophoresis with a biological molecule. Do you want that molecule to be positively charged, negatively charged, or have no charge? And all of the electrophoresis that we've talked about, do you want a positively charged, negatively charged, or neutral, no charge molecule? What do you think? Connor, what are you thinking? Emma, or maybe you have your fingers below where I can see them. We want our stuff to be negatively charged. If you ever forget that, remember the only way to do electrophoresis with DNA, DNA is by itself negatively charged. We don't change the charge on DNA. It's always negatively charged. And so we have our cathode at the bottom of our electrophoresis gel. And so stuff is gonna migrate through because it's negatively charged. Now proteins are unique because we've just been talking about, we can have proteins that are either positively charged, negatively charged, or maybe have no net charge. And this is how this electrophoresis kind of separation works. So let's think about this for a second. I'm gonna ask you another question. This is gonna be a thumbs up or thumbs down question. If we are thinking about, um, if we want to have the top of our gel, so this is a pH gradient. We're either gonna go from high pH to low pH or low pH to high pH. Tell me what you want the top of your gel to be. Do you want the top of your gel to be high pH or low pH? I'm gonna give you like 10 seconds to think about it and then we'll have your reveal. So do you want the top of your gel to be high pH or low pH? All right, five, four, three, two, one. Show me what you think. All 
All right. Sorry, Kate, wrong on this one. It's going to be a high pH. Well, think about this. I So if we want things to be negatively charged, you had that part right. If we want them to be negatively charged, we have to have high pH to deprotonate them. Okay, so high pH. So we're going to start out at a high pH. Now let's think about what happens here. I'm not going to have you guys kind of vote on this one. I'm going to kind of walk through it. As we migrate something through, everything starts out negative and it's going through this concentration or this, this pH gradient. So really as we go from high pH to low, we're gonna keep decorating proteins with protons as they're going through this gel. And we're gonna to get to some magic point when pH is equal to pi. And now this protein has no net charge. Remember, we're not saying that there's no charge on the protein, there's no net charge. So if something has no net charge, it's gonna stop in an electric field. So that's how isoelectric focusing works, is you start with everything, whoop. Oh, you guys can still see me there, right? Yes, that's what I was worried about, that this was gonna disconnect if it went to sleep. So when you have something that is um, negatively charged, it's gonna start migrating through the gel share my content here. And as soon as it hits the pH that is equal to its pi, it is going to stop moving because now it has no net charge and it won't migrate in an electric field. So that's how isoelectric focusing works. So let's see here. So isoelectric focusing is a way that we can separate proteins based on a property. So you can separate them based on size and molecular weight or PI. That's one dimensional. We can use two dimensional and that's basically separating based on two properties. And so what you get here is you're gonna get a gel. So I'm gonna draw a gel here. And what you're gonna have is you're gonna have a protein sample that you have here and you're going to separate things maybe in this first dimension using molecular weight. Right, so we're going to get a bunch of bands there that correspond to large proteins at the top, small proteins at the bottom. Okay, so that's, and you could do the same thing with, with PI, but we usually start with molecular weight first. And then what we're gonna have is we're gonna have a pH gradient. So we're gonna separate in the second dimension by pi. And we said that we were gonna have, right, a high pH over here and a low pH over here. And now what's gonna happen is each of these bands will migrate until they reach what their pi value is, and then they'll stop moving. So it's unlikely that you're gonna have something that has the same molecular weight, meaning it's the same thing here. You might have two proteins that have the same molecular weight, which means they're gonna be right on top of one another there. It's unlikely that they're gonna have the same molecular weight and the same PI, meaning you'd separate them in two dimensions and you'd never really separate them from one another. Now that could happen, but it's not likely. So does the concept of a two-dimensional gel make sense to everybody? I'm okay. just a little bit confused on like the one the one D. Are you still using the pH gradient to do that? So good question. So this is this more gets at some of the practicality, or I shouldn't say practical. The, the practical and applied kind of pieces of this, literally what you do is you will have what we call a little tube gel. It literally is like a little pencil worth of electrophoresis gel and you migrate your sample in there. And then you actually take that tube that has separated this and you slap it adjacent to a big square gel. And so stuff will migrate out of here into that gel. Does that help make sense? So yeah, it's actually, so it is two separate gel pieces and how you run a two dimensional gel is, and you can purchase ones that actually will have a top strip that is um, a molecular weight gel and then it's, it's connected to a pH portion. Or you can sort of do this the old fashioned way by having a tube gel that separates by size and then you literally physically butt it up against that pH gradient gel. 
and then you run it in another direction. So you actually have to physically turn your gel so that um, the electric current, because when you start out, the electric current is going to be negative and then positive. And then you actually will have to turn your gel within your gel box so that it now runs in another, dire in, in another direction. So good catch. I mean, it's something that, yeah, there's, there's like practical aspects for how do you actually physically do this. Everybody good? Gradient gel, is it still like an agros gel, like that same texture? Good question. So agros gels tend to be very loose. And so we're gonna use those for very large pieces like we have with um, uh, DNA and stuff like that. We're gonna use something called polyacrylamide. So it's a different kind of substance that makes a much uh, finer mesh, if you will. So when we do protein gels, which we will do them next week, um, we'll use a polyacrylamide gel. All right, question four here, which is related to gels, is how we think about staining. So we're gonna talk about Kumasi staining and then what we call an immunoblot. So this pre-lab question asks you to think about what's the same with these and what's different. So what's the same with Kumasi blue and immunoblot is they're both ways to visualize proteins. So they're both visualization techniques. Did you guys hear that? That was my cat. I know the poor guy, he's got like a respiratory he gets stressed out and like it's like a respiratory thing he just gets like super clogged and then he sneezes and so if you hear that that's larry so sorry about that all right so that's what's the same is kumasi blue and immunoblot are both going to detect protein okay what's different is sort of the method and their specificity so what's different is the method and the specificity Okay, so Kumasi Blue. Kumasi Blue basically stains all proteins. So we've actually seen this, um, uh, this stain before. We talked about it, I think, last week when we contrasted the difference between like Ethidium bromide and then Kumasi Blue. This is a positively charged dye that interacts with a negatively charged protein. And so wherever protein is, it's going to associate and interact with it and bind to it from a charge standpoint. And then that's gonna allow us to visualize it. But it's not specific for any one protein, it's going to stain all proteins. Now this is different from what we call an immunoblot. If you've talked about this in another uh, course, this is also called a Western blot. It basically is going to use an antibody that's specific for your protein. So it uses an antibody that's specific for your protein. So the big difference between Kumasi Blue and Immunoblot is all protein, your protein. All protein and your protein. Okay. So with that Kamasi blue, you said it was like a negatively charged molecule that attacks. Or no, attaches it's, a, on it's a positively charged dye. Does that like influence it at all for like the electrophoresis? You stain afterwards. So after your electrophoresis is done, then and everything has moved to where you want it, then you stain it with this this dye. Okay. All right, last question here. Oh, Larry. Oops. Is I want us to think about what we're going to see. So think about that FPLC. Oh, oh my God. He's got. Oh, I have to go help him here. Hang on a second. Larry. Oh, come here. Oh, 
This is also the cat that decides periodically that he just wants to pee all over the house, which is loads of fun. Is he the one that steals your protein? Yes, he is the one. And if he didn't have those like really cute um, like aspects to him, I don't know if we would have kept Larry very long because he is he he's been peeing for a long time. But he has these amazing like cute properties that. <sighs> All right, so. Envision that FPLC trace that we looked at that you had to label with all the proteins, right? It has peaks that are in it. So what I want you to do is think about, for example, if these were the two peaks that we had. One of the things that I didn't like how that looked there, hang on. There we go. So one of the things I want you to think about is after we do an FPLC, and we're going to have to then identify which fractions we might be collecting. So maybe let's say if, if this is our FPLC trace and we're kind of splitting this up in terms of fractions that we have here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, for example. What I might look at is say, you know what? This is really what the entirety of protein two looks like from its peak. If I'm just making these peaks sort of symmetrical, they're overlapping, but if I'm sort of making them be symmetrical, this is what maybe protein one's peak looks like. And I've got some fractions, say between four, five, and six. These protein fractions are likely containing both proteins one and two, right? Because those peaks are overlapping. So what I might need to think about is if I wanted to isolate um, uh, all of protein one, so let's say I want to, to isolate all of protein one, which means I'm going to maximize yield, I probably want to collect fractions three through six. Right, does that make sense? That if I'm gonna collect, well maybe even, yeah, three through six here, right? If I collect all of those fractions, I'm gonna maximize the amount of protein one that I might be getting. But the downside is that I'm gonna have contaminants. Because it looks like pretty much fractions four, five, and six also are gonna have some of of protein two, okay? So if I wanted to isolate only protein one, that is I wanna maximize purity, I probably, what, hang on, what are you doing? No, come here. I don't know what you're doing in that box, but you can't go in a box. You pee in boxes. To isolate only one protein, or to only isolate protein one, I want to maximize purity. I probably only want to collect fraction three. So in that case, I'm going to sacrifice yield. Does that make sense to everybody? So these are kind of mutually exclusive. I can't in this scenario have my cake and eat it too. Now, if these two peaks weren't overlapped, oh, I don't know what you're doing here. Hey, Sam. I need to, I'm in class right now. Can you take him down to the litter box? The cat's in the box right now. I don't know what he's doing. Can you please just take him? Thank you. He was like in my husband's box of stats notes. And I'm like, that's the last thing I need is for him peeing in there. So if these two peaks were well resolved, well, I probably could have my cake and eat it too, because I could take all of peak number one and there wouldn't be any of peak number two kind of contaminating it, okay? So we're gonna use these kind of pieces as we go through our protein tutorial now. 
Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to shift gears here and I'm going to go to my computer here. And oh, first we need to, I keep forgetting to do this. Um, I'm going to need to go back to the other group here. You guys need to pick some numbers. So let's see how many there are. I think eight of you here. Wait, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Yes. One, two, three, four, five, six. Two of you will have to pick a number that's already been taken. But uh, right now I have 4, 8, 12, 14, 16, 19 that are available. Does anybody have what a preference? Number two? Well, you can go with Chloe then. Oh, you wanted to, no, see, there's a couple of proteins here that are, that are problematic. So I, I've taken them, I've taken them off the list. So if somebody has, has a favorite number, let me know what you want. Can I do number five? Cause I know you said that two people are going to have to double up. Yep. I'll do 12. Who was I'll that? Do Connor. I'll do 11 and double up. Who was that? Bailey. Bailey, you said? Yes. Okay. All right. So everybody else gets to pick their own. I can do number four. It's Ashley. Ashley. Thank you. Andrew, 19. Okay. I'll do 14. That Lexi? Was that Lexi? I couldn't see who was talking. Was that you, Lexi? Yeah. Okay. Emma, what do you want? I'll do number eight, please. And Kate, you get 16. <clears throat> Dr. Brennan, can you repeat what this is for again? I'm sorry. That's okay. You each are having your own protein that you're going to use um, uh, in our protein purification tutorial. Oh. Okay. So you just need to know what this number is for our next step here. Okay. So I'm backtrack real quick. I just came up with a question. Yeah. So with those like overlapping peaks and whatnot, could I take like my entire like um, <clears throat> contaminated sample and then purify it more or are they like so similar you can't? No, that's exactly what we're going to do and what we're going to learn about in this tutorial is oftentimes you'll have multiple purification steps that you string together. Okay, so the next part, and I'm going to walk through kind of with my, the reason number 10 is not on there is that's my protein. That's like my demo protein. So I'm going to walk through what you guys are going to need to do with your own proteins. Okay, so let me start sharing my screen here. Let's see, where is, all right, so there should be a link for you guys on the lab handout. If you uh, need me to, I can put it in the chat, but it's basically going to take you Um, actually, I think that it's, it starts, it starts at what, does anyone have it nearby? It's, it's Ag Booth. Oh, I think it's this one. Is it this one? I want to get to what it looks like when it starts. I think it's the one that says Java. Okay. I just wanted to get to where it, what it looks like when it starts for you guys. This is where you should end up. Oh, here. Yeah. So you just want to make sure that you don't do the, don't, don't do the app. Okay. Um, you want to access the free online version. So you're going to get to a page that looks like this. So if you'll bear with me for about five, six minutes, I just want to walk you through what you're going to need to do. And then the rest of the time you guys can kind of play with it with your own protein. So you're going to always start here from the beginning and choose the default mixture. Okay. These are also, uh, the, all of these steps in these directions are in, there's like a lengthy 
like tutorial handout that walks you step by step through. So if you need to, you can kind of pull that up, but I just kind of wanted to show a real quick overview here. You're gonna click on default mixture and there's 20 possible proteins, so that's why I had 20 different numbers. Mine is number 10, so I'm gonna go like this. So, on there's a page in your lab handout that basically says you're supposed to put down your protein number, temperature stability, pH stability, molecular weight, and PI, okay? So that's what we're gonna get here in the beginning here. I know that this protein is stable up to 50 degrees, pH 3.5 to 11.5, so I'm gonna say okay. Now, when you're doing, you're gonna to have to tell me three purification strategies, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But there's these three columns that we have here. Each of these is gonna represent a unique sequence of steps that you take to purify your protein. So you see here where it says, it says starting mixture, the number of milligrams. That's this, that's the 511 milligrams that you start with, okay? So that'll be what goes up top. With this little down arrow here, we're gonna write the steps that we take, whatever clicks we do, so that essentially I could do the same purification that you did. So we're gonna walk through that in a second just to kind of show you that. But the first thing you're gonna to need to do, and you'll only need to do this once, you need to figure out what the molecular weight and the PI of your protein is, because that will help you in terms of determining what you might wanna to do to purify. So the first thing you wanna do is you're gonna do a two-dimensional page, and what comes up is that Kumasi blue. It's showing all proteins, okay? Now the question is, is I need to figure out which one of those is mine? Do you guys remember? How do I, how do I stain a gel just for my protein? An immunoblot. An immunoblot, okay? So when I click this, I'm gonna see what my protein is. You'll do the same thing for your protein. Now I can draw a horizontal line across and it'll tell me my molecular weight. So you're estimating this. And then a vertical line up will show me the pH at which my protein stopped moving. And so that will be my PI. So that's how you'll get those two parameters. So now we're gonna have all the information we need to kind of think about designing a purification strategy for our protein, okay? So there's a, just a little question here, which is like the pre-lab, how do I know, uh, how, are, how is this information gonna influence my chosen purification methods, okay? So now what I need to do is start trying to purify my protein. And this is sort of like a choose your own adventure book. If you make the wrong choice, the alien might kill you. No, I mean, you might get fired, which is very real. If you make a choice, that is wrong, you will get fired. You just start over, but just know that then that doesn't work. So the first thing we need to do here is we need to hide the blot, okay? We can't do anything next until we hide a blot. Here is your sort of important tab for doing purification procedures. If we click on separation, we can see the four different kinds of columns that we talked about. There's gel filtration, there's the ion exchange, hydrophobic interaction, and then affinity. So you can pick one of those. These two are ones we really haven't talked about yet. These are sort of crude methods. You could do what's called an ammonium sulfate fractionation or a heat treatment. And if you click on this, for example, if you wanna know what that is, you can click down here and it'll tell you what a heat treatment does. You don't have to read any of this, but as you're trying to understand like why would I wanna choose this? Like heat treatment allows you to increase the temperature such that some proteins unfold and then they denature and precipitate out. And maybe yours stays in solution. So this whole idea, remember when we did our plasmid mini prep, some of the stuff precipitated out so we could get rid of it. Same is sort of true here. So I know that my protein was stable to 50 degrees, so let's maybe go up to 45. I don't know, let's try 15 minutes. And I'm gonna say, okay. And then what happens is I get a little report as to what happened. This is where it'll tell you if you got fired, if you did something you weren't supposed to. But importantly, what I would write in this first little thing here, now don't write right away, because if something doesn't work, you can't have it be part of one of these. You're only gonna write three that are successful. And I'll tell you what it means to be successful in a minute. 
but I would write down heat treatment, 45 degrees, 15 minutes. I need to know what were the steps that you took? What were the clicks that you had in this program so that you could get there? Now what you're gonna do is you'll say, well, what's the milligrams of protein that I have? Okay, so that's 424.4. This enrichment, this number should always be increasing because we're going to get more pure. Enrichment is like purity. Protein milligrams, that's like, that's our yield, okay? So, and then this last little piece here, I'm gonna tell you what to do here. It says impure, and then it has these um, parentheses here. Your purification is not done until you have one spot left by Kumasi staining. So I'm gonna click on this and say, all right, show me my gel. Oh, I still have a lot of spots there. I'm not done yet, okay? Now I did help purify it a little bit, but I still have lots of spots there. All right, so I need to try something else. Um, you know what, let's do that ion exchange. We, we did that today in class already, right? We did that to purify that mix of five proteins. Let's just do exactly what we did in class. There's the DEAE. We used a salt gradient. So those are all things you'd write down in the, anytime you click on something, you need to tell me what you clicked on. Um, we were at pH 8.1. Um, and then we went, we went from zero to 500 millimolar. So that's good. And then we get what looks like this. We get an FPLC. So importantly, I need to know where my protein is. Now, when we do this next week, it's gonna be pretty cool because we'll see tubes, test tubes that are fluorescent green. So we'll know where our protein is. We can't do that here. So we have a magic button that says, tell me where my protein is. We do an enzyme assay. There's where my protein is, okay? If your peaks are ever too big, you can kind of come up here and dilute them a little bit. But now I need to figure out where, I'm, where I want to pool fractions. And you'll notice here, remember we, we, did, we increased our saltiness, so there's, there's, our, there's our enzyme activity, so there's our salty curve. Um, here's our uh, absorbance at 280, so here's where proteins are. So now I need to say I want to pool some fractions. Okay. And to Andrew's point, early on, you might want to err on the side of taking more than less because you're going to do another purification. So let's check this. Let's say I want to go from 60 to 80. You can press this little check and it shows you the area that you've highlighted. Well, maybe I can go like 63. Nope, 62 maybe 61. If I want to get all that red and I need to make this one a little bit bigger, that'll give me everything, right? So I'm going to say now, I'm going to get rid of a lot of these contaminants. So I'm going to say, okay. And now it shows me, yeah, I lost a lot of protein. Look, I'm only down to 173, but because I took the entirety of that peak, I still kept 100% of my protein and I enriched it a little bit. All right, let's go ahead and see if I'm down to, oh, I'm not down to one spot yet. Got lots of spots left, lots more work to do. All right, so I don't know. Let's try one of these affinity things. Those sound fancy. Maybe let's do, maybe there's a his tag. And if I have a his tag, I need to use the imidazole. I'm gonna do that. And with these, like, you're like, what is this hot mess? So you can click on info and it'll tell you a little bit about how each one sort of works. All right, I'm gonna say, okay. Oh, that is magical, right? I only have one thing. This is, this is amazing. Uh, uh, let's see, where is my stuff? My stuff is right there. This is awesome. I must be down to like only one. I'm gonna pool everything, because that, that is everything. So that looks like it's from what? Like 15 to uh, 35. Yeah, I want all of that. Awesome, oh, wait, my enrichment didn't go up. My yield didn't change. What's going on here? Let me look at a gel. All of these proteins have his tags. So I used a purification scheme that didn't make my protein different from anything else. Right? Okay. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to tell you, Bailey got kicked off because of her Wi-Fi, but she's trying to come back in. Ah, uh, got it. Okay. That's why. All right. <laughs> Uh, so let's see. If I want to do something else, I always have to hide my gel. 
All right, darn it, that didn't work. Mm, let's see. What if we did, what if we did like an antibody? Like, oh no, let's see, let's, let's try, let's try something, let's try like one of these, like the gel filtration things. Um, I don't know, what does it tell me to do? All right, these just look like they're based on sizes. Hmm. All right, I'm just going to pick something that looks like it's middle of the road here. Oh, that was good. Separated a lot of things based on, on size here. All right, where's my stuff? Where's my stuff? Where's my stuff? Anti-enzyme activity. All right. Um, let's pool. What do we want to pool? Hmm. Maybe from like... 60 that looks good maybe from 60 to like 75 let's see what that looks like all right that maybe that's good maybe let's let's try that oh look at my enrichment went up this is what you want to be looking for your enrichment going up okay um i'm not i don't have a lot of protein anymore i didn't lose too much of mine let's see what my spot looks like <gasps> i'm done I have one spot, right? That's what you want to get to. You are done when you have one spot, okay? So I did a heat treatment. I did um, uh, an, uh, a DEAE column, so I did an ion exchange column. Um, I tried a his tag, but that didn't work. And then I did a size exclusion, and that worked. So one of the things you'll have to write down here there's a spot here that says, tell me something that wasn't successful and why you think it wasn't. Well, when I did that step that did um, the affinity chromatography, it didn't do anything, but that's because all of the proteins had a his tag. My stuff wasn't different from everything else that was still in solution. So I could put that down in that area for something that didn't work, and I understand why. If you get really lucky and you go through all of these and then everything worked, you're just going to have to like force it to do something that you don't want. So maybe choose a high temperature. Maybe do a pH that's outside of the range you're supposed to. You could probably try to force get fired, right? But the idea is you need to have three separate purification schemes that get you to here. The goal is you're going to have one that maybe has the highest enrichment and one that has the highest yield. So I want to know why you think maybe this one was the best for enrichment, why this is the best for yield. And as you're choosing these different schemes, understand that it doesn't have to be completely unique. Let's say that we know that these three steps worked, heat treatment, um, DEAE, and then the size exclusion. Just try switching the order. See if that matters. Okay, that's totally fair and valid, um, but I just need to have three that are different in some way, shape, or form. Get yourself down to one protein, um, and then there's just a couple of things to comment on here. What's your lowest yield method, your lowest enrichment method, and then three steps that weren't successful. Okay, so we have probably 20 minutes left here that I'd love for you guys to sort of just practice on your own, and that way I'll still be here as you're starting through this, if you have questions about, I don't know what to do here or what this means or what I'm supposed to put where. So feel free to go ahead and, and, and start. I'm going to hang out here and just kind of address questions if you have them. Hey, Dr. Prente, do we use the default mixture? I forget. Yes, use the default mixture. Otherwise, Hayden tried doing this uh, this afternoon. He's like, he used the custom mixture, but I think that has 60 proteins in it. So I said, you're fine to stay with that one. I said, it's just gonna be much more complicated because you've got to separate your one from another 59. Um, so the default mixture is, is better. Dr. Parente, mine didn't tell me it's molecular weight or it's PI. Am I doing something wrong? So remember, that's where we need to, and let me go back to sharing my screen here. Or am I still sharing my screen? Still I am still sharing my screen. You guys are watching everything I'm doing. Sorry about that. All right. Um, so the first thing, so let me go ahead and start from scratch. So the first, and you'll only need to do this once. 
default mixture, I chose protein 10. Um, so the first thing you need to do is do a two-dimensional immunoblot so you know where your protein is. If I draw a horizontal line across here, wherever it intersects, this y-axis is going to give me my molecular weight. That's what MR is, my molecular weight. So I'd say for this one, it's like maybe 23. And these are KD, this, these are kilodaltons. Okay. Okay, and then I draw a vertical line up and I see where it intersects and okay, my PI, which is again the pH at which it has no net charge, so it stopped moving, I don't know, maybe 5.7, something like that. Does that make sense? Yeah. Dr. Prente. Yes. Um, so how do you know when to really like stop purifying it? Like what should your enrichment number be around? It's, it's not necessarily that your enrichment number reaches a certain value. When you do a two-dimensional gel that's stained by Kumasi blue, you get one spot. Okay. So all, all I did was one step and all of a sudden I have a 98.2% yield with a 33.1 enrichment. And one spot? Um, I have two spots. Ah, so you're not done yet, but you're close. You have to have down to one spot. Okay. Uh, Dr. Prente? Yes. Uh, I'm trying to do a ion exchange and it asked me my gradient limits. What am I supposed to be putting for that? So let me look here. I just, I wanna make sure I see. So you're trying to do ion exchange? Is that what you said? Yeah. And what, yeah. what did you? What did you pick? Do you know? Um, let me hit cancel and just do it again. I'll walk through it. So did and this is separation. one of those things. As, you're, as you guys are doing this, you might just want to have like a little scratch paper that you're kind of writing down the steps that you did. And then once you know it's successful, boom, I'm going to write it down on my uh, on my thing. So go ahead. Which What did, what did you pick? I did D-E-A-E. Oh, but I chose a pH gradient. Should I be choosing solid you can, gradient nope, for that's the fine. You, can, you can choose a pH gradient, and then the next step will be choosing the pH of the buffer. And if you want, you can just start out by leaving everything default. But then your gradient limits are be, what do you want your pH to run between? If it just runs between the defaults of 6 to 7, you don't have a very wide range, but maybe that's, that's all that you need. What would happen if I chose to do a salt gradient? So it's still going to ask you for your gradient limits, but then it'll be your salt concentration. So then if you chose salt, then it's like, what do you want your salt to run between zero and what's your maximum kind of concentration of salt? Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. Dr. Perini, I have a question. It's yeah. Ashley. I just have my camera turned off. So I got my first step to work because mm -hmm. a lot of the dots went away. Yep. So what What do we put in the EM? In the the, in the impure box with the parentheses on our... So the parentheses is the number of spots you still see there. Okay, so, so just count them. Just physically count them. And that's why this it's easier to do with this default mix. If you chose Hayden's mixture with 60, then I'm like, <laughs> you got a lot of spots to count in order to tell me how many have left. So I, I don't know if he's going to switch back to the uh, other one or if he's going to stick with the, the um, that custom mix. Okay, thank you. All right, you're welcome. Okay, Dr. Prenti, I'm still down to those two same, like, just two dots. And I'm, yep. trying, I'm trying to do, like, um, a pH gradient or something. How do I figure out, like, what I should have my buffer set at? Um, so a lot of this is just making sure you don't fall outside the range of what is allowable for your protein in terms of pH. Um and then sometimes it's just, you don't, you don't necessarily know. So like, tell me a little bit about the two spots. Are they close to one another? Are they far from one another? Um, as far as like their size, they're almost identical, but for pH, my and or my protein has a PI of about 5.4 and the other one has about 6.8. Okay. So that's the thing. One of the things like the, the, the biggest challenge, and if you looked at the, like the, the series of spots that you have when they start, let me grab something to show you here. Um, when I first started doing this tutorial a long time ago, 
Oh, where is this? Mm, hang on. Here. I actually went through and I labeled what all of these guys are. So like I labeled which each one was, like one through 20. Mm -hmm. What you can see is there's some that are like right on top of one another. You know, so there's going to be ones that are might be easy to separate, ones that are not. And then here's here's why 13 and 17 aren't numbers that you can choose is because they're actually out of range. They have PI values that don't even allow them to appear on here. So that really stymies students because they're like, I can't find my spot. And it's like, yeah, I'll, I'll take those like tricky ones out. Mm -hmm. So that's why I was asking if you have two spots that are far apart from one another, there's something that's different. Now, if they fall on the same horizontal line, they have the same molecular weight. If they fall on the same vertical line, they have the same PI. So you have to make sure that you're not trying to separate them using a technique that won't allow you to separate them. Like ones that have the same PI, you can't use an ion exchange because that's they're, they're similar in that property. So I don't know if that helps, but it did. Um, and some of it is just like a little bit of trial and error, just kind of trying to play with, oh, let me try this, you know, and that certainly can be something. If you had something that worked and you want to just find another one that works, unless you want to play around some more with a completely different sandbox, just change some of the parameters that you did for something that worked and see if it made it better. You know, did your enrichment help um, and so forth. Okay. Good day. Yeah. Like on the page where it has like the three columns where we like report our steps. Yep. Where it says in, like the impure with like the parentheses, is that just like what percent impure it is? Or like do you want the whole count, purity? Count the number of spots. Oh, so, oh. Count, so when you do your um, 2D gel that shows the Kumasi, count the number of spots you, you see. And as long as it's not a one that's there, you're not done. Okay, so we don't have to like report the yield or anything at all? No, nope, the only two parameters that I want you to report are protein, because yield is sort of, um, uh, I mean, it is important, but the, the two parameters I want you to report are protein um, milligrams and then your enrichment. Okay, sounds good. Thank you. You're welcome. And feel free to keep working. You know, we're, we're just about at time. So feel free also to kind of sign off and keep working on this. This is a lab that I'm going to have you guys turn in. I'll say a little bit more about it tomorrow in class when we have everybody together. But it is a lab I'm going to have you guys turn in. Um, there's a couple more things that I'll need to give you information-wise. So, But we'll have this be due next week, Wednesday. Okay? But I think we did, we've done a good portion of it already. And I think you guys know what you need to do to kind of finish out this last little bit. And promise me, and I'll say this tomorrow, remind me if I don't, I don't want you to spend, if, if you really cannot get, I, I think I've weeded out all of the problematic proteins, but I, this should not be something that takes you more than like 45 minutes to work on. So if you are spending more than 45 minutes, you know, let, let me know. Um, and it might be another protein that is problematic that no one's ever told me about before. But I think the ones that I've got here are okay. It, it shouldn't be something that takes an inordinate amount of time. Okay? All right. I'll still hang out here for a little bit. If anybody still has any other questions, you are free to uh, go enjoy the rest of your afternoon. At least it's not raining anymore. Okay, thank you. All right. We'll see you guys.